ask all the invited uh, speakers to to this session. This is a really the ABFER. I remember was uh, no two years ago. Uh, uh, the, um, one of the main organizers of the ABFER asked me to put a, together a session on blockchain. I was, and then I was telling him, you know, I would be interested in doing it if it's a really about the, the intersection between the computer science and the economics, because I see a great potential for research in this area, as I see that uh, the future of blockchain is really on thinking hard about the, the business applications on this uh, fantastic technology. So today we have uh, four papers. Uh, I invited four people here. It's all on, very active on this topic. Uh, the first, uh, the first uh, speaker, and then she, uh, Unfortunately, that uh, she just uh, emailed me uh, several days ago that uh, she uh, has some pers personal affairs that uh, she can't um, you know, present in person. But she's recorded her presentation. Uh, and uh, so the first speaker, basically, we will ask her just to um, show, um, play her video. And of course, if you have questions, feel free to just type in and we will relay to Ellen. Um, and Ellen is an associate professor from Carnegie Mellon. She was at the, um, Cornell and she just moved. And she's a, a leading ex expert on the, on, the, on the protocols and consensus mechanisms. Uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting me. I'd like to talk about a fun topic, essentially blockchain inspired protocols where game theory meets cryptography. This is joint work with Hubert Chen, Kaiming Chan, and Ting Wen. Let me begin with a motivating example that's actually a true real life experience. Uh, so this is not uncommon in the crypto community. Uh, so you write a paper and you discover there's a concurrent work that has the same result as you. Uh, this has happened to me a couple of times. Uh, and specifically in 2013, I wrote a paper entitled uh, Multi-Input Functional Encryption with my co-authors. Um, and we discovered, you know, there's another identical result. Uh, both papers got submitted to Eurocrypt and the WISE PC recommended that the two papers be merged. Okay, so th this means that we share the same presentation slots at the conference. And now comes the hard challenge which group should go to the conference and present the paper? Of course, both groups were very eager to go to the conference. Um, so how do we resolve this challenge? Uh, a naive solution is for Shafi, who's a co-author on the other paper and, and myself to just deal it out. Uh, but of course we want a more civil solution. And here's an idea. Why don't we run a coin toss protocol? For example, we can use um, the coin toss protocol proposed in the original uh, groundbreaking work of Blum. Uh, the way it works is the following. So let's say Shafi and I, we each pick a random bit and then we commit to the bit. We post the commitment to a public bulletin board. And, and in this case, we are using a blockchain to act as the public bulletin board. Okay, so in the next step, essentially, Shafi and I both open our committed bits, and then we can take the XR of the committed bits, and we use the XR outcome to determine the winner. So in this case, I've placed the bet on one, and, and I win. And, and you know, in real life, this also happened. Actually, we did run the coin toss protocol over the internet, and our group went and presented the paper. Okay, so I may be a little bit worried, right? Because, you know, Shafi is also eager to uh, have their group go present the paper. So she may not follow the protocol, honestly. Uh, fortunately, this is a commit reveal protocol. So any kind of misbehavior is actually equivalent to aborting. Like for instance, if you open the commitment wrongly, then this can be observed um, by just reading messages on the public bulletin board. Uh, and it's, we can just treat it uh, the same way as if, you know, Shafi has aborted. Uh, and now um, the idea is 
if any player aborts, we can just declare the player has forfeited and the other player automatically wins. So in other words, it doesn't make any sense for you to deviate uh, from the protocol. Okay. So if Shafi aborts, we would declare that the outcome is one. Um, and at this moment, we can think about how to formally define the coin toss protocol, right? So we need uh, two properties, correctness and fairness. So correctness is easy to define and it just uh, has the most natural definition essentially if both parties run the protocol honestly, then the outcome must be a random coin. Um, but the more interesting question is how do we define, fa define fairness? Uh, the standard line of work on multi-party competition in the crypto literature considers a very stringent notion of fairness. I will call it uh, strong fairness in the rest of the talk. So strong fairness requires that even if Shafi aborts, I would nonetheless output a completely unbiased coin. Uh, unfortunately, this strong notion is known to be impossible in the two-party setting, or more generally in the multi-party setting when the majority of the parties can be corrupted. And this is actually due to a very elegant law bound proven by Cleave. And this is a well-known law bound. Okay, so at this moment, it may seem a little funny, right? Maybe I seem to be contradicting myself because I just said Blum's protocol can solve our problem. But on the other hand, um, if there is actually a law bound, how can Blum's protocol work? Uh, if you think about it a little bit, little bit more carefully, you realize actually Blum's protocol, in fact, doesn't achieve this very strong notion of fairness. Uh, it achieves something strictly weaker, which I will call game theoretic fairness in the rest of the talk. Uh, so in the protocol we have seen, right, Blum's protocol, it's not like Shafi cannot bias the coin. Shafi can indeed bias the coin, uh, just by aborting, uh, but it can only she can only bias the coin in a way that uh, hurts herself and helps me. So essentially, here we are considering rational players who care about maximizing some utility function, and game theoretic fairness requires that you know no matter what Shafi does, she cannot benefit herself or hurt me. And, and if this is the case, Shafi's best response is just to play the protocol honestly, and therefore honest behavior would be an equilibrium. Okay, so it's not hard to formally show that Blum's protocol achieves game theoretic fairness in a two-party setting. Um, and we ask a very natural extension of the question, right? So what about the multi-party multi setting? Can we achieve game theoretically fair and party coin toss protocol? And in general, n can be greater than two. So at this moment, it's not completely clear yet what, what the formulation means. Um, I'll explain that uh, in more detail in a little bit. Uh, when, we first working, when we first started working on this problem, we discovered that this very natural question hasn't been considered at all in the crypto literature. And this was quite surprising to us. And in, uh, essentially, although the multi-party computation line of work started with Blum's protocol, which actually achieved a game theoretic notion of fairness, most of the subsequent, subsequent works uh, in the community instead focused on strong fairness. So before I explain our game theoretic notion in more detail, uh, let me mention that under some very strong assumptions, we can have trivial or immediate solutions, and these are not the settings we are interested in. Uh, first, if we are willing to assume honest majority, in other words, the majority of the parties behave honestly, we can basically just use honest majority multi-party computation with fairness and guarantee output. And this can be achieved in constant number of rounds, right? So because coin toss is just a special case of general multi-party computation. Um, but you know, in a decentralized environment, in blockchain smart contract applications, oftentimes honest majority is just not a reasonable assumption because like oftentimes, in a smart contract context, right? The player can make up many pseudonyms, uh, make up many public keys. So it could well be that the majority of the public keys are actually con uh, controlled by a single entity. A another trivial solution is essentially to assume the problem away. Uh, so suppose there's some trusted party that does the coin toss for us. Um, and in fact, we can even assume the, the trusted party can just simply choose um, 
uh, pseudorandom seed a priori, and whenever uh, we need a random coin, we can stretch the pseudorandom seed to get it. Um, but of course, like in this solution, the coin wouldn't be predictable because everything would be predetermined. Uh, so in the blockchain context, oftentimes we just don't want to assume a trusted party, and we also want the coin to be uh, unpredictable. Okay, so with this in mind, we can refine the problem formulation. We're actually asking, assuming corrupt majority and no setup assumptions, that is in the play model, can we actually achieve game theoretic multi-party coin toss? So if we conclude that you know, multi-party um, game theoretically fair coin toss is indeed possible, the next immediate question we may care about is the round complexity of such protocols. Um, and, and indeed, you know, in the rest of the talk, we are going to be mainly con concerned about the round complexity. Okay, so without further ado, to understand n-party game theoretically fair coin toss, we have to first define the problem more precisely. It turns out that there's actually two very natural formulations. And in the rest of the talk, I'm going to focus mostly on two. I won't have time for the first formulation, but I just want to quickly mention the first formulation anyway, because we have a couple other papers that study the first natural formulation, right? So in the first formulation, um, you can just think of it as binary roulette. Like imagine every player will place a bet on either zero or one. And if the bet agrees with the outcome of the coin toss, then the player is a winner. And the winner basically, all the winners, let's say they will divide the pot evenly amongst themselves and the losers get nothing. Okay, uh, so in the second formulation, it's more like lottery um, and it's equivalent to leader election, right? So we have M players, we want to choose one player at random to be the winner and the winner takes the part of all bets. And so it turns out that these two formulations have rather different feasibility and infeasibility results. And for the first formulation, which I won't have time to cover in this talk, we actually have a complete characterization of the when it's feasible, when it's not possible. And, and, and these are described in two of our recent results. Uh, and then in the rest of the talk, I'm going to mainly focus on the leader election lottery formulation. Uh, so before I go into technical details, um, I want to mention like, you know, it's good to keep the utility function in mind, right? So uh, as I said, in the, in the lottery setting, right, you can imagine the winner takes the, uh, all the pot, uh, but we can also just rescale the utility. Like it's in fact more convenient to consider that the winner has uh, utility one and everyone else has utility zero. Okay, so this is the utility function I'm going to um, use in the rest of the talk. Uh, and I also want to quickly mention that leader election has a lot of applications in blockchain contexts. Like for instance, imagine there's a smart contract, it's soliciting workers to provide verifiable computation and the worker can get a reward for providing the service. Uh, and in this case, maybe many people will want to contribute because they can earn some profit. Um, okay. So before I talk about our protocol, I want to first quickly mention a folklore protocol called the tournament tree protocol. It's a very natural protocol. And, and this you know, will allow us to have something concrete in our minds. So in this setting, imagine we have a set of cryptographers and they're trying to decide who will be chairing the next um, crypto conference, let's say. I mean, of course, chairing a conference is a lot of work, but imagine all these cryptographers, they're altruistic and they're eager to contribute to the community. So all of them want to be elected. Uh, so here's what we do. We pair these cryptographers um, into um, pairs and each pair will run Blum's coin toss protocol to elect the winner. Uh, the winner will survive to the next round and in the next round, we do the same. We pair them up uh, and each pair runs Blum's protocol, uh, choose the winner. And this goes on for, in general, if there are N players, this will go on for log n rounds until at the very end, you know, the, the root, whoever survives at the root will be declared the final winner. Uh, I want to mention, right, if at any point you um, deviate and, and remember deviate is like basically the same as aborting. If you ever abort, you just automatically forfeit and um, you, you lose this round. 
Okay, so this is a very natural tournament tree based protocol. And this protocol actually achieves a very strong notion of game theoretic fairness. Uh, specifically in the in this tournament tree protocol, uh, essentially no coalition can benefit itself. Like no, even if the coalition can control, like let's say the majority of the players are even up but one player, there's no way the coalition can benefit itself. Um, like, and this is for the reason I said, because you know, anytime if you uh, mis misbehave or which is equivalent to aborting, uh, then you just forfeit. So it doesn't make any sense for you to deviate from the honest protocol. And we actually also have a second property, um, which, uh, and that's also important. Um, in a tournament tree protocol, we also uh, guarantee that no coalition can harm any honest individual. And this is important because, you know, imagine there's, let's say, a smart contract. It's soliciting workers to provide verifiable computation service, right? Because the workers are getting rewarded. Like maybe it's in my interest to monopolize the system. So I'm eager to drive away the competition by harming smaller players. Uh, so basically, if a coalition can indeed harm individual, uh, honest individual players, then it'll create this incentive for these players to participate in the ecosystem. So if we guarantee these properties, then things are very nice because the honest behavior would then be at equilibrium. It's the best response for every player and every coalition. Um, and uh, no matter what your goal is, right? Your goal may be, you may be selfish and profit seeking. You may be malicious and just trying to harm other players and monopolize the system. You may be paranoid and trying to protect yourself from the worst, worst case possible scenario. No matter what your goal is, um, your best strategy is always to just follow the honest protocol. And this kind of matches um, the game theoretic properties we want in a decentralized environment. So now we know that game theoretic fairness is possible in log and run, right? Because of the, the folklore tournament tree protocol. Uh, here's a really interesting question. Can we achieve the same, but you know, in smaller number of rounds? Uh, again, remember we are considering the corrupt majority setting uh, and also going forward for convenience, whenever I say fair, I just mean game theoretically fair. Okay, so since we want to achieve this in smaller number of rounds, we have to try a first uh, natural idea. Essentially, we are going to take the tournament tree protocol and just collapse it to two rounds. And the way it works is like in the tournament tree protocol, you have this commit and reveal uh, for log and rounds. But what if we just like commit all the coins uh, we ever need, right? And um, in, in a single round, and then in the next round, we just open all the coins and then we compute the tournament tree to decide the winner. So would something like this work, right? If, if this worked, we could solve the problem in two rounds. Well, I guess, Perhaps not surprisingly, this simple protocol um, is completely broken. And here's a possible attack. Uh, here, let's say Shafi and Alessandro, they form a coalition and they have a definitive winning strategy as follows. So Shafi will commit to zero, zero, right? And these are the two bits you are going to use in each of the two rounds in the original tournament tree protocol. And then Alessandro will commit to one, one. So now they, they wait until the other bracket, the honest players have committed and opened their commitments. And now they can see that Dan is um, going to survive to the next round in the other bracket. And they also know what coin Dan will open in the second round. And now they can just choose among themselves. Like they can choose either Shafi to survive or choose Alessandro to survive because one of them can just abort. And um, by having this choice, they have a definitive winning strategy. Okay, so unfortunately this naive idea doesn't work, right? This is, in some sense, it's good news because it makes our problem more interesting, um, but we have to think harder. And this brings us to our results. So we prove a lower bound and an upper bound, and let me start with the lower bound first. Uh, we show that if you tie your hands and you restrict yourself to protocols that are very similar in structure to the tournament tree protocol, then there's nothing much you can do. Log n is essentially the best. Uh, and what do I mean by 
very similar in structure to the tournament tree protocol. So remember the tournament tree protocol works um, by commit and then immediately review, right? So if we constrain ourselves to the commit and then immediately review model, um, then the tournament tree protocol is actually the best we can do. Um, but I want you to think of the low bound as more like a sanity check in our protocol design. This is actually not a deal breaker because who says we have to tie our hands like this? Um, so indeed, if we are willing to make a couple of relaxations, so specifically, if we are willing to uh, relax the fairness notion to approximate fairness, which I will explain in a little bit. And additionally, if we are willing to make a general cryptographic assumptions, right? Let's say we don't have to rest restrict ourselves to the commit and immediately review model. Um, then indeed we can asymptotically improve the round complexity. Like for instance, we can have protocols um, as small as log log n rounds. Uh, but of course, I have to elaborate um, uh, on two things to make our result clear. So first, what do I mean by approximate fairness? And second, you know, what kind of assumptions do we need to get this uh, log log n round result? Uh, so I'll explain these two questions one by one. So first, let me explain what I mean by approximate fairness, right? So we actually define epsilon fairness, where epsilon is like a slack factor. Um, the fairness notion is like pretty much similar to what we have seen, except for this epsilon slack, right? So first we want that no polynomial time coalition, PPT stands for probabilistic polynomial time. So no um, computationally bounded coalition should be able to increase its utility um, by more than an epsilon factor. So epsilon, you can think of it as something really, really small, like let's say 1%. Um, and secondly, we want to make sure that no large coalition, that the coalition can be as large as one minus epsilon fraction in size, but even such large coalitions should not be able to reduce any honest individual's utility by more than epsilon. Okay. So as I mentioned, like in this talk, I want you to think of epsilon as 1%, but actually our result is a little bit more powerful. We can actually prove epsilon to um, something even like as small as little o of one, but I, I won't have time to go into the details there. Okay. So just think of epsilon as 1%. And what's also useful to keep in mind is that our approximation, approximate notion is a multiplicative notion. Um, this is in some sense the most natural notion, right? For, for instance, um, like, what this means is that you're evaluating your gain, um, your gain you know, by deviating from the protocol, normalizing to your gain had you played honestly. And this is meaningful, like for instance, if the protocol is repeated multiple times, uh, let's say there's a smart contract uh, soliciting a verifiable computation service, right? This will be done multiple times. And in these cases, like the absolute value of the utility doesn't mean very much. And it's like the relative gain uh, that matters. So that's why we use the multiplicative notion. And, and again, you know, here we want to achieve incentive compatibility. And in this case, we guarantee that um, the coalition, like it makes very little sense for the coalition to deviate. Like you may be able to do just a tiny little bit better by deviating, but the gain is, the relative gain is so tiny, it's not worth the effort. Like if you deviate, you can get caught, caught you can get exposed and so on. Uh, so in this talk, I'm just going to stick with these simple notions, but in our actual paper, we in fact proved to an even stronger solution concept called sequentially fair. I just don't have time to explain this stronger solution concept in the rest of the talk because I want to kind of focus on our protocol techniques. And just very quickly, our actual result is parameterized. Like we allow you to basically engineer the trade-off between the round complexity and the, the approximate fairness. Um, and you can read the paper for more details. Uh, and before I talk about our construction, I want to say that we actually have quite interesting techniques. Um, at a very high level, our construction um, makes use of extractors, which is a combinatorial object. Uh, and honest majority multiparty computation. Um, so th there is actually, this should be surprising to you because, you know, as I said, we are in a corrupt majority setting, the coalition can control the majority of the players. 
So in such a setting, why is honest majority MPC uh, multi-party computation helpful at all, right? Um, and you, you'll see this later. So this is kind of um, uh, interesting in terms of the techniques. Okay, without further ado, let me tell you how we can get this result. Uh, I'll start with the straw man solution. Uh, the straw man solution um, actually relies on a random oracle. I'll explain this in a little bit, but uh, it, it doesn't matter. Like I promise we can get rid of the random oracle at the end. Um, and then it turns out the straw man solution has a couple of flaws. So we are going to fix the flaws one by one, and then we can get um, our final protocol. And at the very end of the talk, uh, I can quickly mention the sequential fairness notion, but I won't have time to go into the details. Okay, so here's the blueprint. Um, we want to reduce the round complexity. And the first idea we have is to do com committee selection, right? So suppose we have N players and N is a large number. Um, so we are going to randomly sample a subset of these players to form a small committee, right? So let's say the committee is polylogarithmic in size. And then we are going to run the tournament tree protocol among the polylog size committee. Because the committee is polylog size, the tournament tree protocol would finish in log log n rounds. Uh, and the, the question here is how do we actually select this polylog size committee? Okay. And so here's the straw man approach, right? This approach is actually um, inspired by previous proof of stake protocols like Snow White. Uh, so we are going to imagine there's a random oracle, right? You can think of it as a random function. Like uh, in practice, we often use SHA, SHA-256 to act as a random oracle. Whenever you query the random oracle on the fresh input, it just gives you a random output. If, uh, this is a public function, right? It's a, a function that everyone knows. So if you query it on the same input, then it will just give you the same answer. Okay, so the way we elect um, the committee is, uh, the is as follows. So every player will pick a random bit and they'll post the random bit to the blockchain. And we will concatenate all of these bits and feed them as input to the random oracle. And now we will use the outcome of the random oracle to choose a polylog size committee. Um, and if anyone aborts, we are just going to assume that their bit is zero. So there's a canonical bit if you um, fail to post. So let's think about what this simple protocol gives us. And in this picture, imagine that the red players form a coalition. The coalition has the following advantage over honest players. They can look at the honest coins, right? They can wait until like all the honest players have posted their coins and then decide their own coins. And this means they can try different combinations of their own coins and pick a combination that helps itself the most. Uh, recall that you know, if you want to um, make it more likely for a coalition member to get elected, um, your best strategy is actually to increase your representation in, in this committee, right? Because the committee is going to run the tournament tree protocol, which in some sense has ideal fairness. Um, so, Let's imagine the red players want to include more of its own players on the committee. Um, the good news is that we can actually prove that an adversary that controls any constant fraction of the players um, cannot increase its representation on the committee noticeably more than its fair share. For example, let's say the committee controls 99% of the players. In this case, it'll just have about 99% seats in the committee, um, but not noticeably more. But this means that any coalition that controls a constant fraction of the players, let's say even 99%, cannot benefit itself noticeably. So in fact, proving this is pretty straightforward, right? So imagine the committee has 99%, the 99% the, the red, red players. And if we consider a fixed random oracle query, the probability that the committee elected is bad is negligibly small. 
Here, bad means that the committee has more than 99.1% red players. And because the coalition is polynomially bounded, it can only make polynomially many random Oracle queries. And we can just simply take a union bound over all the random Oracle queries made by uh, the coalition, and we can get that essentially, you know, except with negligible probability, the committee cannot exceed 99.1% uh, red players. Okay, so one thing to observe here is that this type of bound is like a statistical bound about a sufficiently large population. Like it works if the coalition is like 1% in size, it works if the coalition is 99% in size, but it doesn't quite work if the committee is like very tiny. Let's say consider a committee with only one or two players, then, then we don't actually have this type of statistical guarantee. And th this will actually come back a little bit later too. Okay, so just to quickly recap, you know, I said we have good news, right? The good news is that with this simple approach, a large coalition cannot benefit itself significantly. Um, in fact, for any coalition, let's say that's larger than 1%, um, it cannot benefit itself noticeably. But there are a couple of flaws with this theme. The first problem is that a large coalition can possibly harm a single individual. And, and this is related to the reason I mentioned, like this um, statistical bound we just saw, like it doesn't actually work for uh, very tiny populations. It doesn't work for a single individual, right? So for instance, if the coalition can, uh, wants to harm a specific individual, uh, you know, it can wait until all the honest players reveal their coins and they can try uh, different combinations of their own coins, right? It, there are many combinations they can try and chances are, you know, with high probability, it can find the combination of its own coins to exclude the specific individual. Okay, now a second flaw, um, is that for a small coalition, it can actually pretty significantly benefit itself. So at first sight, this may be counterintuitive because I just said a large coalition cannot benefit itself noticeably. So it seems like you know large coalitions should be di more difficult to defend against. Um, but now I'm telling you actually smaller coalitions seem like they're more difficult to defend against in terms of benefiting itself, right? Um, but if you think about it more carefully, it's actually quite natural because, you know, if the coalition is very large, let, let's say if the coalition consists of um, n minus one players, then like the normal utility, the normal expected utility is already uh, n minus one over n. It's already rather large. So even if it can like, uh, increase its utility to one, uh, the relative gain is actually very tiny because the, the uh, epsilon notion is a multiplicative notion. But whereas if you have a coalition that contains only, let's say one or two players, like if you can just increase your utility additively by a tiny bit, the, the relative fraction can actually be pretty large. And, and more specifically, let's say we have a coalition containing only a single player, and then this player can you know, wait until other honest players reveal their coins. And then it has two choices, right? It can commit to zero or one. And by picking the better of the two, it can increase its relative, uh, relative gain um, by essentially a factor of two. And that's, remember a factor of two is significant, right? Because you know, um, here, um, not significant, means you have to be one plus epsilon. So two is essentially considered significant. So, you know, to fix the scheme, we just have to like overcome these two um, flaws. And uh, so we'll do them one by one. So first let's try to fix uh, the first problem. Okay, so the, remember the problem is that a coalition can harm a single individual player. So in order to, to defend against this, Here's our idea, right? Um, the reason why a coalition can harm an individual 
is because it can target that individual. It knows the identity of the specific individual it wants to target. Uh, so our idea is to say, like, what if we just hide every player's identity that's used in the protocol? Um, and we can do this by having everyone choose a random virtual identity. So I'm not going to use my real identity in the protocol. I'm going to choose a random virtual identity. Uh, and at the beginning of the protocol, we are going to each commit to our virtual identity, right? So in fact, everyone makes a separate commitment, but in this picture, I just have one big envelope. And then everyone basically commits their virtual identity, posts the commitment to the blockchain, and then we run this random Oracle-based committee selection. Okay. Um, but this committee selection, at this moment, it's not choosing among the real IDs, it's actually choosing among the, the virtual IDs. But it's making these choices blind, blindly because at this moment, the coalition doesn't know what virtual IDs the honest players have chosen. So once this is done, at the end of the protocol, everyone will reveal their virtual ID, and now we can do the reverse mapping and figure out who is actually on the committee. So that, that's the idea, and then, you, then the committee runs the tournament tree protocol to elect the final winner. So it turns out this idea almost works, um, but there is actually an attack. And the issue is that essentially, the committee, um, the coalition actually knows what virtual ID its own members have chosen. So when the tech is like, it can put all of its eggs in the same basket. Let's say every red player will choose the same virtual ID, and then the committee can make sure that specific virtual ID is chosen in the um, in the pre in, in this committee. So now all of the red players will be able to enter the committee, and that's pretty bad. So in order to fix this problem, we make uh, another fix to the protocol. We say that, you know, you're only elected into the committee if your virtual ID doesn't have any collision with other players. Like if, let's say you want to put all of your eggs in one basket, then that doesn't work because you are basically kicked out um, from the collision. Uh, okay, so if you do this, um, you can prove this protocol um, indeed fixes uh, the, the, this first problem, right? And basically, we can prove that no co a large coalition can significantly decrease the utility of an honest individual. Um, but also, what I omitted to mention here is that in our actual scheme, we actually need a slightly larger virtual ID space to make the probability of collision sufficiently small. So we we don't actually use n uh, as the virtual ID space. We need like more like n polylog n. Okay, so that's how we fix the first problem. Um, and next, I want to basically talk about how we can fix the second problem. And the second problem is, remember, uh, a small coalition can actually benefit itself significantly. Okay, so to fix this, let's first try to understand what's the issue here, right? Because like, even with the virtual ID trick, the coalition still knows which IDs its own members have chosen. So it still knows which virtual IDs to help, like if it wants to help its own coalition members. And, and therefore to defend against the second attack, our idea is to say like, what if we make sure that um, the, the, a small coalition doesn't actually know its own uh, virtual ID? Okay, so with this in mind, um, we came up with the following protocol, right? So um, we are going to introduce what's called a masking permutation, right? So the way you choose the virtual ID is the following. Every player first uh, chooses a random unmasked virtual ID. And, and then this unmasked virtual ID is not the final virtual ID. Uh, so that there will be like a, a random permutation that maps each unmasked uh, uh, virtual ID uh, to a final virtual ID. So, so this permutation serves as like some kind of mask. And how do we choose this um, uh, masking permutation? And in fact, I kind of already gave away the idea in the beginning, because uh, I said, you know, our protocol needs to make use of uh, honest majority multi-party computation protocol. And this is where we need it, right? So because in this case, 
uh, we are considering a small coalition, right? Um, and therefore we can um, use the honest majority MPC to make sure that the small coalition actually um, doesn't know what the masking permutation is. So basically this MPC will commit to some masking permutation such that as long as the coalition is small enough, um, this committed co uh, the masking permutation is hidden. And then at the end, at the end, very end of the protocol, the parties will jointly open this masking permutation and then everyone's final ID will be revealed at this point. Okay, so again, the idea here is that because we are using honest majority MPC, the small coalition cannot predict, predict their own virtual IDs and therefore they don't know which virtual IDs to help. Um, so now what if the coalition is the, um, what if the coalition is large, right? If the coalition controls the majority of the players, then this MPC protocol is completely broken because the MPC protocol only has security when the majority of the players are honest. Uh, and in this case, um, we are still fine because in this case, we don't need the MPC to give us security. Essentially, the, the previous part of the construction and the analysis we had already gives um, the guarantee we need. Essentially, the large coalition cannot benefit itself noticeably. Okay, so I, I won't have time to prove fairness formally. Um, and we are faced with one last question, right? So, so far in the construction, like we have uh, solved all these challenges. This construction works very nicely, but we still have a random oracle. And ideally we want to get rid of this random oracle. Um, and I will ask you to take my word for it. Like we can indeed get rid of this ran random oracle by replacing it with a combinatorial object called uh, a seeded extractor. Uh, I won't have time to go into the details, uh, so I'm just going to skip to um, these slides. And, and because we are replacing the random oracle with um, a combinatorial object, it does make the final protocol a little bit more complicated. And in fact, in the final protocol, we actually have to do a two-phase committee election. Like first, we are going to use um, FIGUS lightest beam protocol. We use a single iteration of FIGUS lightest beam protocol to elect a Pre preliminary committee, the kind of properties we can prove about the preliminary committee is rather weak. So then we will, we will have the preliminary committee run the kind of random oracle based protocol to elect a final committee. I mean, only that we don't use random oracle anymore. We replace the random oracle with um, an, a seeded extractor. And, and then the final committee will um, run the tournament tree protocol. Okay, so, so that's our final protocol. Um, and as, as I said, for technical reasons, like in the final protocol, if you were to get rid of the random oracle, you would end up having to do a, a two-phase committee election. Uh, and I'll uh, refer you to the paper for more details. Okay, so before I conclude, I, I want to quickly mention, um, you know, in our actual paper, we actually proved to a stronger notion of fairness called sequential fairness. And um, in fact, the sequential fairness notion is a much better solution concept than the kind of fairness notion we have seen in this talk. Um, but I also won't have time to go into the details and um, you can read the paper for the formal definition. Uh, our work is related to um, a previous line of work um, that's at the intersection of multi-party protocols and game theory. Uh, specifically, um, our non-sequential notion is actually equivalent to a multiplicative variant of the rational protocol design paradigm. But our sequential notion is actually stronger, like, as I said. Um, uh, what we have also learned from this work is that the approximate fair fairness notion in some of these earlier works, like fruit chain, is actually lacking a little bit. What you really want is the strong fairness notion, which I actually didn't have time to talk about um, at all. Okay, so to conclude, uh, I just want to mention that, uh, you know, there are a lot of problems in the blockchain context that's kind of game theory meets crypto. And this is actually a very exciting area, in my opinion, that needs a new scientific foundation. And, and this is also an area where, you know, industry adoption is actually ahead of academic research. So I think, um, you know, there's tons of 
research problems here and this is like um, you know, a, a space that we should potentially explore together. Thank you so much. <laughs>